United States federal government should prioritize reducing the federal debt over promoting economic growth. Our sole contention is productive growth. The U.S. economy has been booming in recent years. On the day of the balance of 2019 reports, the U.S. economic growth is expected to remain between 2 and 3 percent. Unfortunately, even though the economy is currently at full employment, Columbia University explains that millions of Americans remain in part-time or underskilled positions with minimal wages. While the federal unemployment rate is 4 percent, the U6 unemployment rate, which tracks individuals in part-time or underskilled jobs, is at 8 percent. This is because Irwin's New York Times explains in 2018 that productivity growth has been the weakest in decades because of the roots of the economy have not repaired themselves after damage caused by the 2008 recession. To ensure growth is sustainable and avoids recession, the government needs to prioritize productive economic growth. Negating this is in two ways. First is research and development. The United States is on the cusp of a technological productivity boom. The U.S. Technology Council in 2017 explains that the fusion of information technology can spread physical industries like manufacturing, transportation, energy, and create explosions of entrepreneurial activity. This IT-enabled transformation is set to add $2.7 trillion to the U.S. economic output and $3.9 trillion to the total federal income. However, Kempi of the Atlantic Council in 2013 explains that government R&D spending is expected to decline if sequestration is implemented to reduce the debt. This halts programs in energy, agriculture, IT, and defense. While affirming and implementing sequestration would destroy the tech boom, negating ensures that it happens in the future. In prioritizing economic growth, the Trump administration has grown Silicon Valley. Baram of FCI finds in 2016 that tech companies have received billions of dollars in tax breaks. On top of that, Colgren of Political finds in 2017 that hundreds of millions of dollars in grants have been given to women and minorities for tech startups and education. This investment directly stimulates economic activity. Castellani of the Institute for Labor Statistics in 2016 quantifies that a 10% increase in R&D capital stock increases productivity by 2.55%. In addition to helping the United States, technology helps the entire world. Evans of Huffington Post explains in 2012 that the United States sends technological exports to developing countries that provide new economic and educational opportunities for the population. Jamont of IMF quantifies the relationship in 2013, finding that rapid technological progress in developing countries helped raise incomes and reduce the number of people living in absolute poverty by 18%. This is crucial, as UNICEF in 2014 reports that 1 billion children in the developing world live in poverty and 22,000 of them die every day as a result. Second is domestic infrastructure. According to editors of Media Magazine in 2015, 65% of America's major roads are in terrible condition and a quarter of bridges are in need of rehabilitation, disproportionately in low-income areas. This is why they find that 55% of Americans lack access to public transit. Fortunately, McNicole of CBPP finds in 2018 that Congress plans to invest $1 trillion in infrastructure to boost economic growth. However, infrastructure and debt prioritization are mutually exclusive. As Boehm and Reason Magazine explains in 2018, the infrastructure plan is being financed primarily by foreign and domestic borrowing adding to the deficit. If you want infrastructure, you negate here. Investing in public infrastructure not only grows the productive capacity of the economy, but creates avenues for employment and poverty reduction. Vivens of the Economic Policy Institute further in 2014, $18 billion annual investment in infrastructure leads to a $29 billion increase in GDP productivity and boosts overall employment by 3 million new net jobs. This adds to the productive capacity of the economy as a result. Improves job access disproportionately for low-income individuals, as Gibson of Georgia State University quantifies in 2014, and expanding infrastructure by 3% of GDP increases wealth held by the bottom quintile by 147% in the long run. The impact of productivity is improved standards of living. Hornbeck of the National Bureau of Economic Research in 2018 concludes his 20-year meta-analysis of U.S. productivity that a 1% increase in total productivity increases long-run earnings by 1.5% and employment by 4 because of this, we need it.
information issued in Vermont, which is why a 2015 Congressional Budget Office report writes that when federal borrowing goes up by $1, domestic investment declines by 33 cents. The impact is with growth. Without investment, companies do not have the capital to expand, which is why Mark Goldwyn from the Center for Responsible Fiscal Budget concludes that if lawmakers continue to add to the debt, the economy would shrink by 7% and wages would drop by $6,000 per person by 20 Contention two is a recession movement. The St. Louis Federal Reserve writes that the reality is that recessions happen. They are a natural and inevitable part of the economic cycle. This is why Market Watch contextualizes in 2017 that since 1981, the time between the end of one recession and the start of another is about eight years. During the recession, the U.S. spends money or reduces taxes, a policy known as stimulus, to increase economic demand. The ability to do this is known as fiscal space. Bernstein 2018 from the Washington contextualizes that fiscal space is bound largely by politics. Policymakers simply won't pass much stimulus when they're staring down debt to GDP levels well above average. This reluctance reflects political, not economic constraints. There are two reasons a higher debt hurts our ability to combat recessions. The first is a smaller stimulus. Aaron 2018 of Brookings writes that in 2009, Congress was so uneasy about increasing the debt that the Obama administration asked for a smaller anti-recession program worth $800 billion, even though advisors pushed for a $1.2 trillion package. <clears throat> for a recession to occur now, deficits would approach or even exceed $2 trillion a year. Frightened legislators would be loath to enact even well-considered short-term recession fighting measures. According to Fieldhouse of the EPI in 2013, efforts by politicians to downsize the 2008 stimulus package likely kept it from supporting or creating nearly a million more jobs than it did. Second is premature spending cuts. Hates' 2018 for Goldman Sachs writes that high levels of debt could cause a push to stabilize the debt immediately after the next recession. That could slow the subsequent recovery. This occurred following the Great Recession. After the passage of the 2008 stimulus package, some lawmakers pushed for immediate spending cuts. Unfortunately, Greenstone 2013 for Brookings finds that the sequestration acts enacted shortly after the recession were projected to cost the economy 750,000 jobs. Because of these two reasons, Bernstein 2018 argues that this is why a 2017 study by Christina Romer of UC Berkeley finds that countries with low debt ratios apply anti-recessionary policy much more aggressively than countries with high debt ratios. After a recession, a debt ratio of 27% will result in a fall in GDP of just 1.4%, but a debt ratio of 96% will result in a fall in GDP of 8.1%. The impact is global poverty. By slowing the creation of jobs, we lengthen a, cre a recession. Critically, longer recovery times are especially devastating for developing countries, as a 2009 article by Oxfam found that in developing countries, 100 people are pushed into poverty every minute by economic
the point like if is somebody's, that, if the point is that we don't want to increase our debt. Okay, so like, no, no, if no, we I, increase I our debt and but, we have but, to sell more bonds, no, 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 that's but, when the problem but, occurs. Wait, wait, wait. So, so your argument is just you should not sell more bonds? Our argument is you should not raise the debt. I know the first contention. Yeah, yeah, the first contention on investment. Like, I'm confused why there's more bonds. Yeah, the argument is is that if you have a higher debt, you have to finance that debt by selling more bonds. Wait, wait, wait. Is once you no, no, sell no. bonds, wait, wait, wait. people don't a buy country doesn't property. finance their debt by selling more bonds because yeah, that puts do. that country in more debt. That puts like wait. investor buying bonds no, from the, the United States. The, like, no, no, our okay, wait, debt can I, comes can from I just try and clarify bonds. this real yeah. quick? When a, con- when a company or like when any investor buys a bond from the United States, the United States now owes that investor that bond, which means you yeah. increase the total amount of debt that investor has put in. You can't finance your debt by wait, taking no, 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 out no. more debt from other wait, investors. Wait, wait, no, no, no. The, no, no, wait, wait, no. The way that like people finance the debt is not like China's just like here, I'll give you like a trillion dollars. Like no, no, China no, no. They finance, buys they US finance debt. the debt. Like they no, no, finance no, the like, debt by balancing the budget. That's the argument. You have to cut money from somewhere. You don't just get no, to take I'm out. No, I'm talking about debt. I'm talking about the existence of a debt. Buying bonds is not solving the debt. I'm saying the like okay. high debt is bad because that means when that they debt occurs bonds. in bonds, no, 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 that debt exists in bonds. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. You can have one. So you told me that there's like a bunch of underskilled labor, right? Yeah. And so they need higher positions? Yeah. So, so they how are, does infrastructure solve that? Well, infrastructure gives them the opportunity to be transported to higher income areas, which have higher employed jobs. It's pretty sure. That's what lowers the debt to GDP ratio, and that's the internal linkage to their first contention, because that's what determines whether or not the United States sends more treasury bonds. And then their second contention, that's what determines whether or not politicians are going to be worried about it. And here's why. Because when you implement fiscal multipliers, for example, infrastructure, every $1 in infrastructure is $3 back in GDP, you can outpace the debt with GDP growth. This absorbs your capacity to have debt in the first place, and you can weigh this on probability as well, because the only time we ever have balanced the budget was in the Clinton administration, and he did so with things like the 1990 tech boom and the economic growth that occurred during that time period. With that said, we're solving back for their entire case, but let's get into the nitty gritty. Their first contention talks about diverting away investment. This is dependent on diverting domestic investment and domestic enterprises, but the main way that the government finances their debt is through foreign investment, not domestic investment. That's why their entire contention assumes that we are operating in an isolated economy. The Harvard International Review in 2017 explains that because the dollar is the global reserve currency, there's an infinite demand of foreign people who want to buy our debt in the first place, which is why borrowing and crowding out has never been seen in this country. As to, insofar as with the global reserve currency, borrowing is never an issue and investment is never an issue. But secondly, we would turn this argument against them because if we implement economic growth stimulus policies now under economic growth, that absorbs risk for the private sector to invest in the first place. That, like tax cuts on things like small businesses, even if there's a safer U.S. Treasury bond, still means they can make more money in that small business if we incentivize it with economic growth programs. That's why, again, we've never seen crowding out. And even though we've had the, what, like, one of the highest debt to GDP ratios right now, we even have, they never proved that investment has decreased as a result because the economy's in a boom and our arguments are true in terms of probability. Not on the impact, they say that it's going to hurt wage growth if you have high debt to GDP ratios, but Japan has a 252% debt to GDP ratio, and honestly, they're doing just fine because a lot of their debt is publicly held, so really, their argument is just doesn't hold up in the real world. Let's go to their second contention on recessions. 
they say that a recession is inevitable, but if you vote for them and try and reduce the debt right now, that just creates the very recession that they want to avoid. Specifically, there are two reasons for this. The first one is because the resolution specifies that the affirmative team has to reduce the debt, not just the deficit. That's paying off the $750 billion annual deficit in addition to the $250 billion interest payments. That's close to taking a trillion dollars out of the economy. And given the current administration's view towards where we're going to cut in the budget, the Trump administration is probably going to cut from things like welfare policies, which are negative fiscal multipliers and just put the economy in a very and dry up the tax basis in the first place. But secondly, the Brookings Institute explains that even if there's political disagreement on which place we're going to cut to reduce the debt, automatic sequestration already kicks in because when there's a disagreement, they set the debt ceiling to zero and then everything is cut from across the board. This is terrible because it puts us in more debt in the long term. Thomas of US News in 2013 explains that the same thing happened in the European Union. When they implemented austerity, they ended up with more debt in the future because they dried up their tax bases and they couldn't even pay off their debt, which is a big turn on this entire argument. Let's get into the more specifics. They say that politicians are going to be the ones who are going to be reluctant to pass policies if there's less fiscal space. But this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The Economist explains in 2018 that in the past 10 years alone, they raised the debt ceiling 10 times. It's because no politician is going to get voted into office if they're saying we want to stay in a recession and not pass fiscal stimulus. This argument does not hold up in the real world again. But then they say we're going to have a smaller stimulus package with less fiscal space. You can turn this argument to our side because economic growth inherently creates more fiscal space. The Council for Responsible Budget explains every one dollar in GDP is 25 cents in tax revenue, so we're increasing the amount of tax revenue we have to spend in that time frame. This, and then on their second contention about spending cuts, this is a negative argument. They say that they're going to want to reduce spending even more after a recession. That's why we're saying we shouldn't even implement austerity in the first place. Then on the impact level, they talk about global poverty. Their impact takes out their link, because if truly the entire world was going to be affected by global poverty, they would bail the United States out and not force them to enter a debt crisis. That's exactly what happened in 2008. More foreigners bought U.S. debt to get the U.S. out of the 2008 recession, because everyone is connecting them as a low probability. But and it's for all these reasons that we're proud to negate.
he talked about automatic sequestration. He says you would set the debt ceiling to zero. This doesn't make sense. We're not going to completely eliminate debt. We just have to reduce it. But second of all, we say you would do things like increase taxes. He says that austerity policies in Europe cause them to go into a recession. No, during a recession, Europe implemented austerity policies that were really bad because they not, could not afford to implement stimulus policies because they had such high debt to GDP ratios and such high absolute debts. Then they say that politicians will always raise the debt ceiling because of political pressure and they would always spend stimulus packages. The problem is we're not saying that politicians don't pass a stimulus package, we say they pass a smaller one. But finally he says that economic growth increases fiscal space. It doesn't matter what our economic fiscal space is. We're not contending we can economically borrow more money. We're saying politicians aren't willing to allocate that money to fund stimulus. Finally he says that poor countries are going to bail the United States out of a recession because you see so much poverty. This makes no sense. Poor countries don't have the ability to. Let's go into the negative case. First, on growth, they call they say that a bunch of U6 workers are discouraged workers that haven't re-entered the wage, the re-entered the market. But realize that wage growth is at a nine-year high. Wage growth only happens when you have a labor shortage and employers are forced to pay higher wages to attract workers. So we would say even if the U6 unemployment rate is really high, those workers probably aren't re-entering the economy anytime soon. But then first on R&D, realize that there are a bunch of problems with this. These grants are fostered by the Small Business Administration. There are three problems with them. First, Mercatus explains that the Small Business Administration grants 1% of all grants given out by the federal government. But second of all, reason that these grants aren't even that important because they're mistargeted. They're given to businesses that could probably have funded their research and development expenditures through loans. But third, Science Magazine explains that these grants are really bad because they come with a lot of regulations, which is why, for example, in the National Institute of Health, the demand for grants dropped by 12%. We think that the better way to go is private investment during this time of expansion. But finally, on scale, realize that although they tell you millions of dollars, the tech industry is literally a multi-billion dollar industry. They don't tell you why these grants are so important. But then on poverty, realize that tech doesn't actually go, like spread out to, po- to impoverished areas because the impoverished areas can never afford the technological developments that we develop, so they can't link into technolo- or po- impoverished areas. Then on the second tension, on domestic infrastructure. Realize that even if you buy the infrastructure, is it, like they give you this idea that says that, well, the new infrastructure plan is going to be financed by borrowing. The problem is the new infrastructure spending plan will never pass for two reasons. First, because Republicans and Democrats disagree on whether or not it should be state or local funding. But second, because Trump has said that any infrastructure spending increase needs to be tied to a border wall, which Democrats will never agree to. But second of all, even if you buy the infrastructure spending increases, first, courts explain that government funding is going to affluent areas, so you're never actually going to see this increase, decrease in poverty. But second of all, Howard explains that 86% of construction firms can't find workers, so when you create jobs, you're just poaching workers from the private sector. That doesn't actually increase productivity, which is why you find that infrastructure spending during times of expansion creates zero jobs. For those reasons, you must affirm. Um, can you see if we can get some evidence? Mm-hmm. Uh, just that the infrastructure bill won't pass. And then right, which reason? The state local reason yeah, or the, the border wall? disagree with the state local reason. Yeah. yeah. The border wall is about Trump's infrastructure plan, right? Or just that Trump says any infrastructure bill has to be tied okay, to. Yeah, yeah, we'll see that too. Okay. And, and that's really it. Oh, actually one more. Uh, the yeah. makes zero jobs. said that politicians will just pass a smaller stimulus policy, mm-hmm. but they're still going to be raising the debt ceiling, right? Uh, during times of recession, yes. Okay, so if they're still raising the debt ceiling, then how are you reducing the debt? No, so our thesis isn't that during times of recession, you should stop spending. We're saying that yeah. right now, during a time of expansion, you should reduce the debt so that you don't have to reduce the debt. 
that when we do enter well, a session. No, so the entire thesis is like we need to affirm now so we can negate. Yeah, no, but your but your response to our your frontline to austerity was the fact that we just have to reduce the amount of debt that would be in the future rather than the amount of debt that we have right now. Right, so it's like a but comparative. It's, it's yeah, like I know a it's a comparative, but I think it's a pretty bad comparative considering that if you still run a budget deficit, you're still exponentially adding to the amount of right, debt. Right, like I'm saying that even if we run a budget deficit, our debt, if you affirm now, is going to be a lot smaller than if you negate now. But so I'm saying that, that in your right. world, when we are hit with a recession, the stimulus package that you pass in your world is a lot smaller okay. than the stimulus so package So your argument is, now. rather than have like 100 and, and, and like 25% debt to GDP ratio, we'll just have our 115% debt to GDP ratio. No, like I'm pretty sure the difference is going to be a lot bigger. But well, okay, even that's, if what the difference, trying, that's what I'm trying to press you on, is how much right. is the difference going to be so, to meet the bright line for stopping this yeah. huge recession? So the problem is, is that our contention isn't even a bright line contention. Because the Romer analysis that we read you at the bottom of the case tells you it's a linear impact. The bigger the debt yes. is, the smaller the stimulus package I understand, package but if has. that line is very small, then you're not getting that big of an impact. Okay, so for example, in 2008, because Obama was worried about an 80% debt to GDP, Ratio, he asked for a stimulus package that was four hundred billion dollars smaller. Yeah, and that you're saying, but even though we had a low debt to GDP ratio then, so don't you think there are no, lots of other factors like that go into that? Or eighty percent? No, yeah, that's Obama, considered, that's considered Obama a specifically stable debt to GDP ratio. Obama's, well, no, it's pretty high, but also no, Obama like specifically any between said seventy and ninety is considered oh. like pretty stable. But yeah, yeah Obama yeah, specifically yeah. said that the reason why he never or not Obama, I guess his economic advisor specifically <laughs> said that the reason why they didn't push for a one point two trillion dollar package, even though that package would have been much more beneficial to the economy, is because they didn't think at times with a high debt to GDP ratio that they would be able to get okay, this. Okay, so your numbers. argument is that Republicans don't like we're that Republicans like being in a recession? No, we're saying that any politician doesn't want to increase the stimulus package because they're scared that like voters will in number increase they, that have, they always have, and even if it's smaller, it still like mitigates your impact on a recession because they're still passing stimulus policies. But right, anyway, but we, we say that the difference, for a while. the small difference in four hundred billion dollars, one left like caused one million less jobs to be created, and we say for okay. every minute you wait, you push one hundred people into poverty for a recession. Yeah, so it's not going, like we can afford to, to wait. We're going to contest that, but we've been on this for a while. Yeah, can I have a question? Yeah. So on this idea about infrastructure. Okay. So like, are you advocating for like an infrastructure spending increase? Uh, yeah. Okay. So what's the probability that infrastructure spending increases, given that we've talked like Pretty been high. on this topic for like two years? Pretty high. So Why? right, like we're not talking about the Trump infrastructure plan. Right. Right. Our Just plan is general. talking about no, it's talking about the Democratic proposal that has bipartisan okay. support and everything looks like it's going to pass. So and who's the a Republican reason, senator or Repo Re Republican senator who supports the bill? Mitch McConnell likes the infrastructure plan. He came out and said that you should also support it. Like there's bipartisan. Okay. If you want to see evidence that there's bipartisan support for infrastructure, yeah. we can show that to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
I guess I'll start on infrastructure. responses. One, they tell you there's no support for the plan. I, they're talking about the Trump plan. Our McCall evidence tells you it's a bipartisan plan with support from both sides of the aisle to give $1 trillion into public infrastructure investment. Secondly, they say it has to include a border wall. That's about the annual budget that Trump is proposing in front of Congress. It has nothing to do with this piece of legislation that's passing within Congress right now. But third, they say this funding only goes to rich areas. That's not true at all because our infrastructure plan is specifically giving tax incentives to areas that already have broken down infrastructure to repair their infrastructure, not building new infrastructure areas. But this is why and then at the bottom of, of our case, they say we're only going to create zero jobs. I call for that evidence. It says it assumes that unemployment is at an all-time low, but our Columbia University evidence at the top of our case is going to respond to this because if we, if we're talking, we're telling you we need high-skilled labor and more productivity in order to create higher wages, which is only why, uh, which is why we're going to increase the wages over time by increasing productivity. This gives us our Gibson evidence that tells you by increasing infrastructure spending by three percent, it increases the wages of the bottom income per, uh, quintile by 147 percent. This makes us outweigh the entirety of their case for four reasons. The first is on urgency. You see Berkeley expense if we don't invest in infrastructure right now it gets worse in the future and crumbles further which is why it gets 600% more expensive in the future and costs 3.1 trillion dollars in the future adding to our debt but secondly Aurora tells you well, our growth in the United States through infrastructure also links into the developing world because 1% growth in US and uh, US GDP growth also spills over into the developing world by 1% as well but thirdly is on recessions Hornbeck tells you when you invest in infrastructure you increase productivity which also increases long run wages by 1.5% this means when a recession hits us we have more money in our pockets to, to increase consumption spending which pulls us out of a 
recession. That's what happened in 2008. Before, we can grow out of our debt to GDP ratio. The, co the Council on Foreign Relations tells you that you, uh, uh, United States infrastructure is actually a fiscal multiplier because it creates so many jobs and avenues for employment. Every $1 you invest, infrastructure gives you $3 back. Go to their case on their first convention. They don't respond to the Harvard International Re Review that tells you we're the global reserve currency, meaning that we're going to delay both of their conventions because we can always borrow forever. On the investment argument, nobody's going to default on the United States bonds because we're always the strongest currency, which means this argument is ultimately non unique. But secondly, on recessions, this whole thing is about fiscal space, which means in 2008, when we had a recession, we just continued to borrow from other countries. This argument is also historically true out here on this argument as well. But then Davidson tells you in the last quarter of 2018, because our economic growth was so strong, interest rates were also at an all time low, which means uh, we link it. Can we feel hard saying that that democratic legislation is bipartisan? Yeah, yeah. Is that the same card with the tax incentive? Well, the
something doesn't mean they agree on how to do it. That's why we tell you that they'll never agree on the actual specifics of the bill, especially because we tell you that Trump says any infrastructure bill must come with border wall funding. He can argue for border wall funding on the budget and infrastructure, it's not that hard. But then even if they do link in, they don't link into any impact because we tell you that 86% of infrastructure projects right now already can't find workers. So if you increase the infrastructure projects, there's still not gonna be any workers to fund them. That's why we tell you that infrastructure unemployment is at an all time low. That's why it's not gonna create any jobs on his way. First on urgency, he says it gets infrastructure gets worse, the debt gets worse too, this makes no sense. Second on the developing world, it's not a direct relationship. You see the United States economy increase, but countries like De Greece and Argentina still see their economies declining. But then he tells you we have more money. But if you don't create more jobs because there aren't any more work or there aren't any more workers, then you can't actually like alleviate the effects of a recession before the fiscal multiplier realized that our impact are all about the absolute debt number, not necessarily the ratio, but even so the business insider tells you that debt is growing 36% faster than GDP right now. On our second contention, or on a second contention on our recession. First, he tells you that like we're the global reserve, so it doesn't matter. But ours isn't about economic constraints, it's about political constraints. That's why we tell you that when the debt is very high, politicians are very hesitant to pass a stimulus package. That's why Aaron told you that in 2008, Obama argued for a $400 billion smaller stimulus package because he was worried about increasing the absolute value of the debt. That's why Fieldhouse tells you that we lost 1 million jobs. We are on time frame because we're creating jobs during an ex during a recession, whereas they're creating jobs during an expansion where we already have the jobs that we need. Second on scope, they only impact to discourage workers that may or may not enter the workforce, whereas we impact to the entire world and everybody in the United States economy. And finally on magnitude because our economic that our economy is fine right now, whereas austerity during the recession is only going to make it much worse, therefore you affirm. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, so who would vote for someone who wants to keep us in a recession? It's Wait. not the idea of keeping us in a recession. Like the Republicans didn't really want to pass a giant stimulus package. Two years later, they Wait, won the you House. You just said like, something clearly. Really, really, you just said something really important, right? The Obama yeah. administration didn't pass a larger stimulus. Why do you think that is? Because they didn't think they could get it through Congress. Right. They had a Republican-held Congress. No, in 2008, it was Democratic-held. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, the House was Republican. So why does it matter? So the why Republicans aren't going to want to pass stimulus anyways. So no, what is they, your argument? No, well, argue? they passed the $800 billion one. And right. Also, the because, House was because, pulled because by Democrats. Obama, also, the House no, 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 passed Right, right, right. But, but because Obama had to make a compromise with the Republican candidate. That was why the stimulus was smaller, no, not because no, 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 they no. pointed to our debt and said we cannot no, 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 no. finance. No. Like the Republicans pointed to our debt and said this is why we can't have stimulus. But also right. when Obama but, but the came argument, along, the argument oh, really is quickly. that they had to make really a compromise quickly. with Republicans really anyways. The Aaron card that talks about the $400 billion smaller isn't about like appeasing Republican lawmakers in the Senate. It was okay. specifically when Obama was introducing this in the House, no, 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 he was scared that like, yeah, yeah. lawmakers, no, Democratic wait, and Republican, wouldn't vote for the Senate. I understand, but like, the idea is Obama did that because he had to make a compromise with the other party, not because no, 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 not no. because Obama was like, I can't make a bigger stimulus no, because the debt is No, he was scared that it wouldn't even pass the House, even though the House at the time was controlled because, by Democrats. Because, the, because, because of the opposition. So because no, of the opposition. If That's the, the then, then Obama would just say, House, please pass a large stimulus package so I mean, the Republicans this, fail I, like, and then we can like just maybe, point them maybe as the reason why Maybe you would to some part of the political like chess match, but I would argue this like there's countless other factors that affect our political climate, which you cannot account for. To say it's just like the what? debt. Like what? Like the other party is what I'm saying. Yeah, the other party saying hates both the debt. parties don't want to increase the debt. But our argument is no one will vote for them. So even if they the want to run on a platform that they want to have a smaller stimulus spending, no I mean, American who's in the midst of a recession wait, is going to want to vote for that politician in the first place. Republicans actually voted for the stimulus package if they wait. still won the next election. Yeah, and they want yeah. to be but, smaller. But that information, what wait, we're saying. I have a question. Um, why, yeah. do, why does that respond to the, the Harvard International Review? Because we're not saying that it's going to be economically impossible to right. borrow. We're no, no, saying like I all your arguments no, are like. I understand. Well, like it's like a, it's like a kick out because it's politically impossible. Yeah. Right? But like, if the government understands we can continue to borrow, what senator or what like House I representative think, right? is going to be like? Wait, let's, wait, 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 so, like how they so your link is continued you can on say the no, lack no of knowledge of politicians. It's so, going to get elected and if the they're just like, we're just going to borrow so, $50 trillion. Okay, so rather than the economic ability to do so, your link is contingent on the political ability to do so. Yeah, you're okay. saying that. Okay. okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's an average question. That's what we established and we're saying it's not a very strong. Yeah. But yeah, you guys have a question. Yeah. Okay.
start at this top. They say wage growth is at a nine-year high. Andrew responds to this by extending the Stiglitz evidence. Even if wage growth is at an all-time high, they are in part-time, low-skill jobs, and they have too high of a skill set in the first place. That's like a software engineer working at a 7-Eleven. This is terrible in terms of our economic activity. That's why we're saying there's room to grow the economy and create job accessibility through infrastructure, not just direct construction jobs in the first place. That's not where we're getting our impacts from. With that said, you vote for us on infrastructure. They just say that there's not going to be a way to pass the bill because they don't agree on how to do it. We give you our evidence from McNichols evidence that says in this specific bill there is bipartisan support because they've agreed how to do it. It's by going on and taking more debt and deficit spending, which is why when you vote for us, you fiat that this bill gets passed through Congress in the first place and we invest a trillion dollars into infrastructure. This is critical because the only other response they say is say we create zero construction jobs. We're not just talking about construction jobs. We're talking about revitalizing low-income neighborhoods and increasing access through public transportation to a bunch of different other jobs so they can go from their low-skilled part-time job to a higher-skilled job. Here's why infrastructure outweighs their case. First, on urgency. Remember the UC Berkeley evidence. If we don't invest in our crumbling infrastructure right now, it adds $3.1 trillion to the national debt in the future. This functions as a case turn because this is adding more debt if you don't invest in infrastructure right now. But secondly, remember what Andrew said. It links it to developing countries because every 1% increase in U.S. growth increases growth in developing countries by 1% because of our economic spillover, so we're helping the poorest of the poor develop. But thirdly and most importantly, their big impact is on recessions. The Gibson evidence indicates every 3% increase in infrastructure spending increases wealth held by the bottom quintile by 147%. We give people higher wages, more money in their pockets, so that when a recession hits, consumption spending can drive us out of recession, and that's how you absorb the stock of a recession, not with fiscal sp stimulus policies when it's too late and the recession already hits. Even if they win that a recession is more severe, we stop the recession from happening in the first place with infrastructure, which is why we are a prerequisite. But even with that said, their link is literally just politicians are dumb and they don't perceive that they'll be able to spend on fiscal stimulus. This is a terrible link because they will get kicked out of office, they've already raised the debt ceiling 10 times, and then in, even if they prove it's true, it's such a small like line of, wow, we're just going to have a smaller policy rather than a bigger one, which doesn't give them a really big impact. That's why we're about to negate. Thank you. 